Good morning. How's it get, how are you doing, Isman? Good morning, Ben. Doing very well. How are you? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. So, um, so awesome. Really excited to see everyone here today. So we got just about a minute um, before we get started. So uh, feel free to uh, to come in and share into the chat. Um, you know where you're coming from, and um, and that'd be awesome to kind of see you know where we have people from. I see we have people from um, Kentucky, and then from the UK. And I'd imagine all over the world. So, uh, so that'd be pretty awesome to see. Hey, very nice, Michigan. So, uh, so very nice. Welcome, James. Good to see you, man. So, Oklahoma, Chicago land. There we go. Nice. We got someone from Pakistan as well. Myself and Hassan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh. So, it's, so it's kind of funny. So, just to kind of start before we uh, before we officially get started. So one of my team members is um, is from Pakistan, and then of course repaired us from Pakistan. So it's pretty cool that um, um, they're not quite in the same city, but uh, but they're close enough that they know where each other lives, basically. And so it's kind of funny how things uh, kind of work out that way. Yeah. Um, so cool. Um, we'll get started. So um, let's go ahead and get um, get started. So um, I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today. We want to make this kind of like a workshop. So. Um, this being like a workshop, we do want it to be open dialogue um, and things like that. And the things that we're going to be covering is systems and SOPs. And I'll be sharing my story of how I went from being totally burnt out on my business and totally underpaid to now um, taking home a good salary and having the time freedom to spend it as I please. Like, of course, I still do work. That is very important. But at the same time, I spend a whole lot of time with my family. Like I'm sitting here in my house right now that we're remodeling totally. And so that requires a lot of time freedom to do that. And it's all been because I've implemented systems and SOPs into not only just my business, but into my life. Like everything is kind of based on that. Um, and so, um, so with this being the first one that we're doing with Repair Desk, I wanted to announce that um, Profixer and Repair Desk have partnered together um, to uh, join together to make the repair industry stronger. We identified uh, months ago that each, um, each one of us brings a key um, important aspect to the repair industry. And so um, we have joined um, together as far as um, being um, supporters of each other and holding webinars like this to identify the, the, uh, the places in the repair industry that could um, use the most work and improvement and things like that. And so us as a training provider and then Repair Desk as, um, as a software provider, it kind of brings the best of both worlds to bring our heads together to understand like how repair shops can be better and to understand the complete state of repair shops you know, at the moment. And so, um, so that's really what we are excited to kind of bring up for the next coming months as we, uh, as we work together to identify those. Um, I wanted to give just a moment for Usman to introduce himself um, here on the webinar today and uh, just kind of give a little background about himself and uh, to introduce for anyone that uh, maybe doesn't know who he is um, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of go from there. So Usman, uh, take a couple minutes to share about yourself for as long as you need and, uh, and yeah. Sure. Uh, hello everyone. Asalaamu Alaikum. Namaste. Hola. Um, you know, my name is Usman. I'm the founder and CEO of Repairdest. I started Repairdesk about seven years ago. Um, really looking forward to learn from Ben on the systems because uh, and SOPs on because I myself as a business owner easily get distracted and uh, really lo looking forward to how, how I can spend more time with my family. And I've seen that uh, from time and time again that repair shop owners are constantly spending time in the shop whenever I'm speaking to them at six, seven, eight, they're always working. And um, what I've noticed is, you know, Ben is always roaming around. I kind of feel jealous as well, but, <laughs> uh, but, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, we partnered up. So not only that we can help repair shops on the software side, improving and uh, helping them save time, but enabling them as well. Uh, so uh, they can unleash their true potential and that's the purpose of this webinar. Um, you know, at the end of the webinar will be, uh, uh, you, know, you know, we will have a special offer for people who are not using the paid ads. Uh, it's, uh, it's a one-time offer, so really excited to learn from Ben. Thank you so much for your time uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to doing more of these webinars uh, moving forward. 
Awesome. Well, appreciate the news, man. So um, really excited to, uh, to see how this turns out today. So, um, so what we do inside of here is um, to basically keep all of our communication easy. Um, you know, I think inside of here you can come off mute, I'm not sure, but, um, but what we'll do is um, to kind of set the, uh, uh, like the ground rules for how the webinar uh, works and how to best, um, how to most get, um, you know, how, to get, how to get the most out of the webinar. Um, we want everyone to stay on mute, um, if at all possible. I know some people may come in and it may come off mute or whatever, um, but if you do, um, just go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, the way that we will communicate though, we wanna make this open dialogue. So we wanna take questions and things like that as we see them uh, through the chat. Um, so we're gonna have um, Asan and um, Usman and some other people um, taking those questions, compiling them into a document that we have, and then um, we'll be answering those kind of in, uh, in packets in a way. Um, and the way that we want to communicate here, other than just the questions, is we do a lot of times use ones and twos and threes in the chat. So we may reference and say, hey, type a one in the chat if that makes sense, or type a two in the chat if you need me to clarify anything, or three in the chat if you have any questions, something like that. Um, and that is really like a quick way to kind of gauge where everyone is at. So in that fashion there, type a one in the chat if you're ready to get started uh, today. And as long as we see ones, then we'll uh, we'll we'll get we'll get on with the show. So <laughs> uh, right. awesome, <laughs> seeing a bunch in there. So so awesome. Um, so before we um, so to kind of get started, I wanted to um, share just a little bit about you know the basis of um, of like of systems and SOPs and things like that. So one of the things with that is. Um, I wanted to give a, a, a very simple example, and it kind of may seem like a little bit extreme and things like that, but it'll totally make sense and give really good light to SOPs. But first of all, put a two in the chat if you know what SOP means, um, if you understand what that means. Perfect. So, um, so for anyone that does not, SOP just means a standard operating procedure, um, which a standard operating procedure is just the actual way to do something inside of your business. And it really outlines all of the you know, different functions of the do's and the don'ts of what actually to do in that particular task, whether it's how to take out the trash, whether it's to discuss with the customer you know, a repair, or whether it's to internally discuss one with another or for your team to build a follow-up with you, there should be SOPs and guidelines on how that stuff works. So everyone is all on exactly the same page and all the correct channels are actually being used at any given time. Um, to give an example on the really big importance of SOPs is I wanna share something I call the, uh, like my trash can theory or trash can phenomenon. Um, so who here, um, put a one in the chat if you know how to take out the trash. My office word does that for me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I know where you're coming from, so yeah. There you go. Yeah, so, so if you had to take out the trash, you'd probably know how. Um, <laughs> put, put a two in the chat if you have ever taken out the trash wrong. Like, did you ever try to take out the trash and it just didn't happen? Probably no one. So probably won't see any twos in the chat. But the thing is, this example will bring to light why SOPs are so important and how one simple task can be interpreted in many different ways and they can be assumed the wrong way. So if we think about this, let's say we hired somebody into our business and we brought them on and we said, hey, um, we have a couple of simple things here, take out the trash when it's full, um, yada, yada. And you tell them a couple of different things, right? Or wash the windows when they're dirty, um, all that kind of stuff. And put a one in the chat if you've ever done that before, where you just mentioned to someone, hey, just do this and when it's full. And it's just kind of like the general guideline because it seems obvious enough on how it should be done. Um, so the big problem with that, and we don't want to overcomplicate things and like, you know, become micromanagers, but we want to become extremely clarifying on each and every single task that we give to um, our team. So the thing with this is if we hire three different individuals and we tell them to take out the trash when it's full, we'll probably get three different results. Um, the thing with this is the first individual, perhaps whenever they're told to take out the trash, they think back to the way it was whenever they're at home, where maybe their family is really conscious of how many bags they used on you know, a weekly basis. And so in order to take out the trash, they had to pack that thing full and it had to weigh 100 pounds before they took it out. And they picked it up carefully and made sure they didn't rip off the little tabs because it weighed so much. And then they took it out to you know, the dumpster outside. Um, and that's the way that they took out the trash, right? The second person, perhaps, is from a family that's 
not very conscious about the bags, but they're more conscious about the way it smells and the way it looks and the, you know, how easy things go into the trash can. So whenever they go to take out the trash, they take it out when it's three quarters of the way full. It's very easy to tie, super light. They just can fling it in the dumpster and it's very easy to do. The third person maybe comes from a family who didn't really care either way. And they just played Tetris for you know a whole week until the Gatorade bottle fell off the fourth time. And that's the indicator to say, hey, this thing's actually too full. I think I smell it. Let me go ahead and take this out at this time. And each person is fulfilling 100% on taking out the trash. Put a one in the chat if that makes sense. Where each individual is operating 100% and taking out the trash exactly as they believe it should be done. But the big problem with this is what happens if you walk in and you see your team texting on their phone because that is something that inevitably will happen and you see them texting on their phone, and then all of a sudden, they jump up and take out the trash when it's three quarters of the way full. What are you gonna think at that point? You're gonna put, try to put those two things together and go, they were texting and they probably shouldn't have, and now they're taking out the trash when it's three quarters of the way full. Uh, they wanna go take a longer break than they should because they're not even taking the trash when it's actually full. And you start to look at them and try to find all these problems. And what we try to find, we will, we will find. Um, maybe the other person that lets it play Jenga, we look at them texting, we go, man, they're just super lazy. They just want to be on their phone all day and they don't pay attention to the trash. When for sure they were because they were listening for that fourth Gatorade bottle fall um, and it hasn't happened yet. And once it happens, they'll take out the trash, but it hasn't happened. So they're not there, but they're paying full attention to the trash. But in our mind, we think they're doing it completely wrong. Uh, the first individual that takes out the trash and weighs 100 pounds, we could say, man, that person is so lazy. They never want to get up because they're always texting. And look, they're just stomping on the trash because they don't want to walk those extra steps to the dumpster because they're a really lazy individual and love to text on their phone and they're just worthless and why do I even hire them? Um, put it to in the chat if you have ever felt this way or if that has any little bit of resonance to you as far as seeing like this you know, pattern that can get created. And I think whether we want to admit it or not, it's a very big, you know, thing that does happen where we start to prejudge people because of these stories that we create because of the lack of structure that we've given. And we wonder why some companies are able to have extreme culture where the productivity is amazing and the efficiency is amazing. And then we look at other companies and they don't. And it all comes down to the leader of the business having extreme clarity on what exactly they want to happen inside of the business and then building the structure for that to happen. So whether it's taking out the trash, we don't really have a very specific way on taking out the trash because that gets a little too complex and that's kind of my thing. I don't want things to be too complex, but we want to be extremely clarifying. So our SOP on taking out trash is a simple guideline to say, we take out the trash every single day and we do say until it's full, but it's every single day, 24 hours, regardless, it always gets taken out. So it's one of the duties to be taken out at the end of the day, each and every single day. And we found that the trash never gets full during that time. So that's the way that we've done it is we don't leave it up to their discernment to decide which day to take it out. We literally say every single day, regardless of how much you have in there, it gets taken out. And that is one of the things that we've done to eliminate and remove that particular variable where I may walk in the business and then start to prejudge people because of some emotion that I'm feeling that day because I want to be mad at somebody because maybe someone cut me off and then I go in my business and I'm like, everyone's out to get me. Oh, look, he's texting on his phone, hasn't even taken out of the trash. What a worthless piece of crap he is. Oh, he was lazy last week too. I think I want to fire him. Maybe I will because I'm the boss and I can. And you start to feel all these like really weird things and it becomes super convoluted and you don't really have any productivity. It's really just like, you know, exercise of like, you know, fake leadership in a way. Um, put a one in the chat if that makes sense. That something as simple as taking out the trash can really be the biggest limiter on why your business is not growing. And so I want that to be the basis for everything that we think about now at this point is to understand that common sense is not something that we base our like understanding of a repair shop off of because common sense is only common to what's inside of somebody's head. And as we can see, there's three examples of common sense where we either pack the trash can, we either take it out basically empty. And the third one, we went until we played Jenga, that each one of those common sense to each person was hundred percent correct. Common sense told them that that was perfectly good. The only problem with common sense, it's unique to each individual and it never is going to match someone else. And so 
We don't want to base things off common sense. We want to base things off clarity and efficiency of the solution. That is the, that is like, you know, some of the indicators with that. So, you know, clarity and efficiency of the solution, put it to in the chat if that makes sense there. Perfect. Um, so does anyone have any kind of, um, I think since we're in like webinar format, I don't know if anyone can come off mute, perhaps you can, um, but type into the chat, do you have any kind of, um, anyone have any kind of questions or anything like that before we get, you know, started with the bulk of today? I, I, I believe they can type in the question. They cannot uh, speak uh, okay. because of settings, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I do have one question. I'm, I'm sure you'll be covering this. Uh, I've seen a lot of shops, uh, uh, you know, they are always be busy, but uh, they are barely making when, I mean, because of upcoming recession or even there's recession already over there. Um, so what do you think? Why is that? And uh, how, how do people go about it? Yeah, so I think there's, um, put, a, put a one in the chat, that's a good question if you resonate with um, what Usman is asking there. So overly busy, underpaid, like, and it just seems like you're just working more than it's really worth. Uh, does anyone kind of resonate with um, either having felt that way or feeling that way currently? Uh, so David, yes, we will have, um, yeah, I'm gonna have a, uh, a document that everyone can have at the end of the thing, so. Cool. So it could be mismanaging funds. Um, so what I believe it to be and what I've seen with repair shops since working, you know, directly with them for like a year and a half, uh, like two years at this point. Um, nice. Okay, cool. Appreciate that, James. So, um, so yeah, um, if anyone has any questions, type those into the chat. We'll, we'll take those that way. So, um, so my take on why repair shops are overworked and underpaid it's not necessarily because they're bringing in bad revenues it's and it's it's not necessarily because i guess it could be because they're mismanaging their funds but at the same time even if they're managing their funds better the system that they have won't a lot for more funds to be available so that's like that the mismanaging is is a byproduct of something even deeper um I've discussed on the phone with somebody who recently left the repair industry um, and about a year ago, they were bringing in $75,000 a month um, and they were breaking even on $75,000 a month and they were owner operator as well. So they were operating the business. Um, so they should be able to take home massive, you know, substantial portion of that. Um, but the problem with it that I find is its lack of efficiency in the process. There is something that we do in our store, which we call it pre-authorization and preliminary testing. Those are two different things that we do at the counter where once the device is brought in, we have a very simplified pricing strategy. So it's very easy for us to quote a price depending on the approximations of what we think it should be. And it's extremely accurate. But the thing with that is we test the device while the customer is there, we do what we call a two tech check. Uh, that's something that we've been doing for years now, which basically takes a whole rundown of the status of the device. We gather the backstory. This is part of the check-in process and the preliminary testing. And then we give a quote according to what we believe it should be. And many times people say, well, I can't give a quote because I don't know what it's going to be. Well, hold on, let's just back up and like actually figure out what it could be because there are only particular repairs that you can or cannot do. If you cannot solder, you cannot do a solder repair. So regardless of whatever you think it, in your services that you're able to render, you can't do those. So those immediately drop out. So then you have to ask yourself, if this device comes in as no power, no whatever, no this or no that, I only have a certain, a certain amount of options that I could really exhaust on this device, which could be a uh, charge port battery. You know, maybe it's an LCD because maybe it's just blacked out, who knows? And we go through those things and we quote that actual price with the customer to say, hey, the services that I offer, my, my solutions that I could you know, offer you today is you know, a device that doesn't look like it's taking any power. Um, it could be something as simple as a battery or perhaps a charge port, or maybe it's your screen. You know, the, the most that this would be, you know, would be the screen price, which would be like $185, whatever it may be. And you can quote them those prices. And then you ask them, you say, hey, if it, if it ends up being a screen, would you want me to go ahead and take care of that for you today um, and have that ready for pickup? 
Um, and then the customer obviously is going to say yes um, or no. And it gives us the ability at that point to go, oh, you want it? Okay, well, how much would you want to put into your device? And the customer is like, I only want to put in 85. You're like, well, cool, that matches our battery price. So what I'll do, I'm going to go ahead and just test the new battery once we get it in. If it ends up being that, then we'll install the battery, have it ready for you uh, for pickup. How does that sound? Always oh, sounds great. Perfect. So at that point, what we've done is we have taken care of all the discussion, money, everything like that with the customer at the very beginning. And it then reduces the amount of diagnosing that we have to do on the back end. Too often, we take in a device and we say, oh, it's dead. Let me just check this in and take it in. And then we spend the next hour, two hours, figuring out everything detailed on the device. We're like, ooh, the LCD doesn't work, the battery doesn't work, the charger doesn't work, all this kind of stuff. And then at the end of those two hours, we've been interrupted by customers. It's taken us four now at this point because we've had those interruptions during the day, had to take a lunch, all that kind of stuff. We finally call the customer back and we go, hey, I got your, I got your device figured out. They're like, oh, I'm just sat down with dinner with my family. Um, can I give you a call back? And of course you're like, oh crap, I close in an hour. They try to call back, you're already closed. So you try to call them in the morning. And at that point they're at work in a meeting in the morning and you run out this whole long drawn out process where where at the end of the day, you have now had to postpone other repairs. You've been working like a chicken with your head cut off all for the potential of a repair and you have no idea what the customer is gonna pay. Where in the meantime, they've already lost value in that device because they're like, oh, I've been without it for a day, I'm okay. Maybe I'll just go upgrade my device at at and They check their options there and they go, I don't mind getting another contract or whatever and just paying a bunch of money for that. Oh, that old device sucks anyways, I hated that thing versus if you would have gotten their agreement in the very beginning, you would have already known that and you could have said, oh, all they want to pay is $85 for a battery. Sure, I can actually do that almost while you wait. And then you can get that done, boom, back to them. And then you literally have spent 20 minutes on the device versus the other way where you literally spend four or six hours on the device plus phone tag and everything else in, in, in the mix. Uh, put a one in the chat if that makes sense. Those two drastic different um, processes there. And I'll say repair shops for some reason and small businesses in general, they find a validation in the extenuating steps that they take. They want to feel validated. So they take a hundred steps with every device to make themselves feel important. When I'm like the most important thing that you can do at the end of the day is be profitable, put money in your bank account and to work the least amount of amount as possible because the validation can come in this if you are doing that efficiently and are able to be very quick with the customer, get the money quick, get it back to the customer quick, make that process as efficient as possible. You'll find yourself with massive time in the day just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. And then at that point, then you can take the liberty because you are being paid very well at that point to then sit under the microscope and learn soldering, to then just scroll Facebook endlessly if that's what you want, if you need to de-stress, or to then try to you know, set up your laser and you're not trying to chase bills. Now at this point, you're profitable, so now you're just you know, killing time because you can, because you're being paid for it. So, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so yeah, Frank, uh, so Frank asked in there, um, yeah, I think I think there's an ego with it all as far as you know where that goes, and we can you know really curb that ego down if we if we just realize the most important thing is what the customer sees, how fast we get back to the customer. The customer doesn't care, and we see this in Facebook posts all the time. Customer doesn't understand. I, I spent two days on the device figuring this out, and now they tell me they don't want me to pay for it. But why'd they even bring it in? And we're trying to blame the customer when I'm like you literally set the customer up for failure with your process and it should have been way different. Um, put a one in the chat if that makes sense. Perfect. So I'm gonna go back and read some of these questions in the chat and um, I also read some uh, I also read something online that um, I mean repair shops are in the customer service business. Um, so unless you don't serve your customers well, uh, chances are they're going to go into other stores. I, I also believe that uh, businesses don't make money. And honestly, I make the same mistake. I lost a lot of uh, money, probably, you know, probably half a million dollars. <laughs> um, and um, it's just that you, you're trying to always grow your business and you, you, you're saying, okay, I'm reinvesting in my business. And um, you, you, you try to build all these cool features where, and you make your process so complicated, so complex. And just like in the uh, beginning of the webinar, you need to keep things very simple where just like checking in the uh, 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 
uh, checking in the device where you get the pre-authorization and you do all the tests. I've noticed that when, whenever I go to a repair store, what they do is, let's say if, if they're not using a pay desk, customer comes in, they put a, you know, uh, put a tape on the back of the phone, enter the, you know, uh, enter the name of the customer, you know, uh, and then uh, put their phone number and they say, your device will be ready in 10 minutes. Now the customer comes back in 10 minutes, they're talking to me and they will say, hey, why don't you wait over here for, uh, and I will fix your device. So I, I, I believe customer experience is very important, even though at Repairs, sometimes we fail at giving that experience. I mean, we, we, we try our best and, uh, but, but yeah, just wanted yeah. to share. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I believe we, we had some questions in the comments and would love uh, if you can share more input over there. For sure, for sure. So yeah, um, I think I got some of those. I think I got most all of them. Yeah, Julian, so recommend checking all devices in for diagnostics and let you know for sure. Yeah, 100%. And we charge a, um, one thing I'd recommend is, um, and, and I'll say this is gonna become more open dialogue than, than I had planned, which is good. So if you have any questions, I think this is the, you know, really powerful way to teach. And so, you know, that's the most pertinent things to you guys. So if you bring that up, uh, then we can speak directly to that. Um, so yeah, checking in for, uh, we, charge a, we charge a diagnostic fee, which we charge um, uh, $55 for a diagnostic fee. That pays you for your time. We do credit that towards the repair itself. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's, what we, uh, that's what we do. But even in the case of just base diagnostics, we want to discuss the potential solutions with the potential prices and get the pre-authorization on what those are. We never wanna bring in anything blind because you know, what's going to happen is you're going to run into that whole phone tag thing, or the customer is going to say, oh, your bench fee, the 55, that was for the repair, right? And they're not trying to win one up on you. They're just completely confused because they've only been in your repair shop one time in their whole life, repair shop only in their whole life. And, um, and then at that point, then we have to like, be like, no, no, actually is this, or is that only oh, give a discount because it was confusing. And then pretty soon we're sitting there wasting our time once again versus making it very clear to go, yeah, the solution was $155. We're going to credit over the 55, so it's $100 remaining. You know, it makes it very, very, very clear. Um, so, so Frank, so we, um, so we actually bill almost everything up front. If it's a very clear repair, um, essentially, let's say like a screen is broken um, and it's just shattered glass and it's like, obviously it's just a screen, we, we take the whole payment up front. Uh, the reason for that is we discuss accessories with them during that time as well and protection plans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but sometimes in the very beginning, you know, we may not be able to land the, the whole accessories um, and things like that. Or maybe we have a big line of customers and we just have to be a little more quick with each customer. We can't really take that length of time, but we can mention the accessories. So once the customer comes back, they've already paid for the screen. And then at that point, it makes it very easy to say, hey, yeah, um, the case, you know, I know we're busy earlier, but let me show you some of the cases I do have. And at that point, especially because the environment's changed, they see their phone looking all pretty, they're like, I don't want to damage this thing. Yeah, sure, let's talk about some cases. And you have that second opportunity then to charge them 30 bucks for a case versus having to charge them $130, you know, for the repair plus the case. So it kind of breaks it down. So psychologically, it works out really well to your advantage. The ones that we do not charge up front for is going to be if you have, um, for instance, you know, like a device that's, you know, dead and you're just like, I have no idea what's going on with it, but we believe it could be either as simple as a battery or it could be a motherboard issue. Um, so we discuss those prices with them and we charge the bench fee, um, but we do pre-authorize those prices because we don't want to look into a board issue if they don't want to pay board issue prices. Um, also, you know, we only want to go up to the extent that they want to pay. Um, put a one in the chat if that makes sense as far as like how we, how we bill up front. Perfect. Okay, um, cool. I have a quick question for other repair store owners. How many of them are currently charging uh, customers upfront? Put one in the uh, comments if you're not charging upfront. Thanks to Ben. <laughs> Kevin's the best. Okay. So they, I mean, it's a mix. So I, I, I believe someone mentioned in the comments, probably it was Julian, that uh, uh, a lot of the times you're calling customer 
that to pick up their device and uh, one way to uh, make sure that uh, your cash flow positive is you, you charge customers up front. So I guess that, uh, that that really helps. Yeah, and what Julian said as well, it reduces the amount of abandoned devices that you have too. Like you run into the situation and to kind of like, you know, overemphasize almost you, like we, one of the ones that was like a, I don't know why it's a core memory that got created, but remember we had, it was years back where we had somebody and it clicked in my head. I'm like, we need to start charging bench fees, but the customer had come in, they had a nice iPhone six, it was just a cracked screen. It was an old lady and, a, and an old guy and they brought it in and they said, Hey, we just need to get my, my iPhone six repaired. Um, and we're like, yeah, we can definitely get it repaired for you. And so, um, we took it in. Uh, or no, it no, it wasn't a screen because we had a, we had to di diagnose it. So it was either a dead battery or something like that, but they brought it in and go, yeah, I just need to get my iPhone six repaired. We don't know what's going on with it. It's kind of died. And, um, we're like, yeah, let's take it in. And we're so ambitious to take it in that we're like, we ain't gonna charge no bench fee. We're gonna take this in right now. We're gonna put in all this work into it because we want to do the best thing, best job for the customer. So we took it in, diagnosed it. We, I think we put a battery into it, had to test a screen onto it. So it's sitting over there on the bench with a battery clipped in, a screen clipped in. And we're like, oh, dude, it finally works. This is amazing. We found the solution. So we called the customer back who they didn't answer. And then we waited a couple of days. We're like, this is weird. Why aren't they like calling us back? They finally, after like a couple of weeks, they called us back or we called them or whatever it was. And in the discussion of that, they go, oh, okay. How much would that be? And we're like, oh, it's going to be a hundred and some bucks, whatever. They're like, oh, okay. That's a good, good thing to know. And I'm like, good thing to know it's repaired. Like it's ready for pickup. And they're like, it was for our granddaughter for their, for her birthday. And her parents ended up buying her a phone anyway. So she doesn't actually need it. And I'm sitting over there like, we didn't know this. And I almost wanted to like blame the customer for all of our work that we did. But I'm like, if we would have asked a couple clarifying questions to say, awesome. When was the last time this device was used? They'll probably say six months ago. We'll go, what do you mean six months ago? Oh, it's my old device. Oh, okay. What are you planning to use it for? Oh, I might give it to my granddaughter. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then at that point would have understood we don't really need to have it sitting on our bench, taking up time, being so anxious about it. And if we would have tested, if we would have taken the, the prices for the customer given to them, they would have then been able to tell us, Ooh, that's a little bit too much. We'll have their parents buy my phone instead. Right. And they would have, you know, gone that route. Um, so put a one in the chat, if that makes sense there, like that's, that's a huge one. And that's why we run into a lot of abandoned devices. It's like, oh, it's my old one to give my kid. The kid ends up, you know, being a brat later on down the week. And then they're like, I don't want to get for my kid anymore. So then they just let you keep it for infinite time. Like we have, it was during the iPhone five C era. We have a ton of iPhone five C's. But then we started charging bench fees and that's, you know, whenever we stopped having those. Um, ben, I, I know we, we want to follow the format, but I do have one more question. Uh, you know, one of the things which I've, uh, you know, not, not at repair is, but, uh, you know, how can you avoid constantly, constantly having to remind your employees how, how to do things at your shop where, you know, they constantly forget that, you know, you, you ask them, I mean, does SOP helps over there or what should repair shops do? Yeah. So uh, funny that you bring that up. That, that literally brings us into what the, what the webinar agenda is uh, for today. So it's, um, um, there are a couple of solutions to that, um, that we can easily accomplish in a repair shop. Um, I'm going to take the questions real quick and we'll move on to that. So yes. Yeah. So Shamal, I would definitely agree. Like people are not trained enough. And I think it's because of the trash can theory. We look at it, we're like, how hard is it to talk to customers? Just talk to them. And it's like, well, hold up. Like we could talk to customers in a hundred different ways. And then your customer, like I made a post about this a couple of weeks ago, whenever I said, you know, repair shops have no idea how they want their business to work, but, or they have no idea how they want like employees to work within their business, but they just know they didn't want it done that way. And that's like the, that's like the big thing that, that I see a lot of times is us as business owners, a lot of times we lose clarity because we go, it's easy to talk with a customer. It's like, okay, tell me how to talk with a customer. And then we immediately turn it back around and go, I hired you to talk with them. If you don't know how, then maybe you shouldn't work here. And we have that mindset. It's like, well, hold up. Like maybe we should actually ask ourselves, cool. They're asking for the ultimate playbook on how to operate this business. Let me give that to them. And a lot of times we won't because we're too afraid to stand up and make 
the actual decision on what phrases should we say to customers? What phrases actually work? Like, how should we stand? Like the tonality in our voice, like, should we look at the customer? Is it okay to grab the device? Is it okay to do anything? What should we say whenever we grab the device? Like all those different things, like those things should be given to, the, to your employees so they're fully aware. And never at any time can we ever turn it back around and go, well, I hired you for this. You should know how to do it. Like, no, no, no. I hired you because you're willing and you're capable, but you are not supposed to create the way that this business operates. I do. And then you exercise your abilities to do that within the structure that I have the dream and vision of. That's why, you know, I'm the business owner and you're not right. That's like, that's like the, the idea behind that, but one in the chat that makes sense. So, so we hire people because they're capable. Um, but we don't hire them because they're going to run our business for us, like, or create the way to run our business for us. So. 100% employees need a blueprint. That's like, that's huge. If, if like, just imagine, yeah, just imagine like, yeah, like, and it was pretty simple, but like going to Home Depot or something like that, like, or Office Depot. And then it's like, oh, we ran out of paint. And it's like the person in the paint aisle, you know, what if they were told like, don't you know how to order paint? It's like, no, 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 hold on. Like we've got a whole system for this. We teach you how to do this. Like you go through training to do this. And, um, you know, we'd never just, you know, try to relinquish, you know, our leadership and try to offload that onto somebody else. Um, so going back through here. All right, perfect. Yeah, so Shamal, yeah, if you can sell the value, you can easily fill up front. And the biggest thing that I wanna mention is, you know, too often repair shops talk about how um, customers are argumentative, customers just don't wanna pay the price, customers think you're scamming, all this kind of stuff and leave bad reviews. It's not a pricing issue. It's not any other issue other than trust. We just didn't establish trust with the customer because you don't argue with the people that you trust. And that's a really big thing to realize is if a customer ever gets upset, it's because they don't trust you. And our baseline for our business needs to be established on trust. The way that we talk with customers, trust. The way that we discuss with their employees, trust. The way that we handle the devices, trust. The way that we look, trust. If it's built that way, it gives you the liberty at that point to be a business owner, make mistakes, you know, go through the learning process because the customer will trust you and they'll know that they, that you have their best interest in mind versus if it looks like a money grab, if it looks like a sales pitch, if it looks like anything else other than trust, the customer at that point won't work with you and they won't allow you to go through the learning process. And so that's the big, like we don't have customers that ever give us like, you know, of course you have like the random person every once in a blue moon, but like, you know, we don't have like, you know, the consistency of bad customers. Um, where at one time we did, but we don't anymore. And it's all because of the way that we do things. It's all based on trust. So um, put it to in the chat, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so yeah, Terry, it's all in the communication training um, and it's constant training over and over. Yes, 100%. Yes, I 100% I, I agree. You know, too often we train once and then we expect someone to remember it six months later. And it's like, no, 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 hold on. You should have been talking about this week after week. It should be like ingrained in the way that you do things. Um, so cool. Um, so the um, so the one question, um, could you ask your question again, Usman? Or I'm pretty sure I know exactly what it was, but I was gonna hit that again if you, uh, if you remember what that was. Yeah, I mean, how can you avoid constantly having to remind your team how to do things at your shop. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, so one of the things, so the big thing that I wanted to um, to go over and for us to set up today, and this is gonna be the first steps on how to create SOPs. I'm gonna give you the framework as well, but the first part that we have to do is we have to get aligned communication with everyone in our business. Um, so the big excuse that I see is people say, well, we just talk with each other. We tell each other face to face. And I'm like, well, cool. Do you have like a chat channel? Do you have any kind of like communication, you know, messenger chat? And they're like, no, I just talked to him in person. I just tell him I'm like, okay, hold on. That's not what I asked. Like, do you have anything like that? Right. So like put a one in the chat for anyone here. Um, if you have a communication channel, whether it's Slack or Hangouts or something like that. Okay, cool. So very, very, very important to have, even if you are sitting in the same room as the other person. All your communication should go through there. So um, by way of typing in the chat, what is most everyone using um, for theirs? Are you using Slack, are you using Discord? What are you using? Nice, Discord, Messenger, WhatsApp, Slack, nice. So one of the things that we use, we use Slack in ours. Um, I use Slack for a couple other things as well. So it just kind of made it easy to have the same piece of software open. Um, 
yeah, Teams is a pretty good one too. I think you can do a lot of the same thing as Slack. Discord is great as well. Um, so one of the great things that we have with this is we want to have our, um, we want to be able to create um, a communication channel. And this communication channel is going to serve as like the vehicle to understand where our business needs the most work. Uh, so kind of what Usman said is like, how do you prevent having to tell your team over and over and over again, the same exact thing? Well, first of all, it could come from misalignment from yourself. Maybe you are not aligned in the proper way that you're, um, you know, showing and teaching someone how to do something, or maybe it doesn't look important to you, right? And so they're just kind of being, you know, a little, uh, um, a little looser with it, or maybe they haven't been trained at all and it's all just up in the air. So one of the things with this is we don't want to overcomplicate our business. We don't want to have to try to cut our business to a halt. Um, so what we want to do is we want to create a communication channel that can then house um, like the pre SOPs as they should be done. So what we want to do is um, to kind of give a background to this, I want to give like, um, has anyone ever read the book E-Myth? Put a one in the chat if you have read the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It is the most phenomenal book in the world. So I read that book um, a couple of years ago and it completely changed my life. But if you read it, you're probably going to think it's talking about you and you're probably going to feel really embarrassed about the way you've been doing things the past couple of years. So if you don't believe me, what I'm saying here on this webinar today, which you may not, you may not know me from anyone yet. You may just have shown up because you like his mind and, um, and he told you to come here. And so you may not know who I am yet. Uh, but if you read Emeth, it literally piggybacks everything off what I'm saying. And this has now created the new foundation on how I live my life and how I live my business and do everything. It all talks about creating a very clear path to success for each and every single individual. And the clear path looks the same, you know, for that same task for anyone in the business. And that's the most important part of it is the way we talk with the customer is not um, just, oh yeah, talk with them in a way that like, makes the customer happy. Like it's not, we use these phrases because these phrases um, create a happy experience for the customer. And we wanna reduce the amount of like unique work that we have to do um, in, order to, um, in order to get the best results each and every single time. So what we wanna do in this, um, or one of the big things with that that I wanna uh, discuss before we go into the communication channel is uh, the understanding of what it means to delegate versus abdicate. Um, does anyone here know the differences between those? I guess put one in the chat if you know the differences. Put a two in the chat if you're not quite sure what the two differences are there. All right, cool. So get a few there. Nice. So um, I'll share real quickly what um, that is. So the delegation versus abdication. So the two big differences between those. Delegation is creating a framework or a game plan for somebody and teaching somebody how to do that task according to that framework and then having expectations set on follow-up and everything like that so you understand fully what's going on. Abdication is where you verify if you believe someone knows how to do something and then you say, cool, I can't do it myself, so go ahead and do it for me. And there's no follow-up, there's no game plan, there's no teaching, it's just, hey, do you know how to take out the trash? Go ahead and take it out. And you leave it up to them to figure it out versus the other one to say, hey, do you know how to take out the trash? Okay, cool, glad you know what that is. So we take it out every 24 hours um, and you always take it out every 24 hours, regardless if it's very empty or very full. Um, so if you give them those guidelines, that'd be delegation. Abdication would just be uh, take out the trash whenever it's done. Um, and those are like the two different, um, two different things there. One can be followed up on the other one, because you give no instruction, you literally have no ability to follow up on it. So whenever we look at our business, I want to share a little bit about where, you know, I came from with my business and um, kind of what brought me to this point um, today is um, is a couple of years ago. Um, let me see. I was uh, there. We go. Um, letting somebody into the in the webinar. Um, so a couple of years ago, I had run my business in a fashion that was complete abdication, and I didn't want to believe that it was that way, but it totally was. Um, so put a one in the chat. If you hire people on their ability to repair devices, if you're like, Hey, you're pretty good at repairing stuff. You're very knowledge of the repair industry. Like I want to hire you. Like put a one in the chat. If that's kind of who we look for, um, whenever we hire people. So <laughs> Tim, 
what's up? Um, good to see you here. So the um, so with that being said, that is I gotta say one of the first it can be one of the first mistakes that we run into with running our business and creating a business that's built on application. It all starts with the expectations that we set during the hiring process. We go to look for people who we say already know how to do the job. We go to people who we accept that they already know how to do the job. And because of that, we base their pay off of the previous knowledge that they have on how they can do things because what are we trying to do? We're trying to fill a place in our business where either we're burnt out or we're tired or we're trying to grow and we're like, you know what? I don't want to deal with that anymore. I want to hire someone that knows how to do it just like I did. And so you go to find somebody and you put them into that spot. So from the very beginning, we hired them because we said, hey, you already know enough. I'm burnt out from that position. And I want you to be able to run it for me. And third thing, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because I'm going to hire you and pay you for this, right? Are you sure? Like, that's like the questions that we asked and like, oh yeah, I won't let you down. You're like, all right, cool. Thanks. So you put them in that position and then what happens? You step back and you take a look at them to see how well they're working. You go, hmm, they're good at fixing. The oh, I like that new technique. That's great. Like, oh, they're really good. Oh, they're good to talk about the customers too. Okay, cool. I'm going to step back and see what else they're doing. And pretty soon they start to do everything in the business. And really we're just sit, taking a step back and going, man, this is great. I have some new freedom because now they're doing everything for me and they're doing it really good too. So put a one in the chat if you have ever felt that way or if that is like an aspiration of yours. And I'll like, I want to put a big, huge one in the chat for myself because that's the way I ran my business before. But the big problem with that is what happens in the event that the customer or that the employee does something wrong? What if they say something to a customer that didn't really quite sound right? We're going to kind of change it. Or maybe the repair process is a little bit different or maybe like what Frank mentioned earlier. Now at this point, we want to start implementing systems with the team that's already been there. What do you have to do at that point? You have to break your expectation that you originally set with them. So originally what you told them is you said, hey, I identified that you have the skills to run my business. And I'm gonna compensate you very good because you know how to do it and you don't need any help from me because you're already smart enough. And a lot of times we say that too during the hiring press, we're like, dude, this is great. I'm glad that I have someone that's as smart as me. Man, it's really hard to find people like you. It's really hard to find people that think just like I do. And pretty soon we're labeling them as the owner in a way. And then at that point, once we bring them into our business and we're going to correct them, we break all those expectations. Then we say, if we ever have to correct their repair process, more times than not, the way that it comes off, no matter how nice we say it is, hey, I'm sorry, but I made a mistake when hiring you. I wasn't, I didn't have enough clarity to realize that you did not know what you were doing, even though I'm paying you well because I said you were and because I admitted to it and because I let you work for a couple months all by yourself. But I realized that there's a flaw there. And at that point, the person, that's what they feel on the inside, no matter how nicely we say it. And then on the inside, they're thinking, I thought you said I knew how to run the business. And they're like, but I've done this for the past six months. What's the change now? And maybe they look at the reports and they go, ooh, it's kind of slower they're kind of getting a little more tight because maybe they're hurting. Maybe they can't pay their bills. Maybe that's not even the case, but maybe they're just trying to match things to figure out like why now all of a sudden they're being micromanaged. And you look at it as why are they resisting me leading them to a better result? But on their side, they're thinking, why am I being micromanaged? I already knew how to do this. He told me I didn't know how to do this, but now he's micromanaging me. And us, we're saying, why are they so resistant? And then that is when the owner, the, the, employee within the business is born into an owner and then they go you know what i've been running this place by myself and it's been working for the past six months year two years whatever i'm gonna go start my own business because this person is trying to micromanage me now because he wants more of the pie because the pie that he originally gave me is not good enough he wants me to take less of it he wants to take more of it because he sees how good i'm doing this business without him and then they go you know what it's crazy the past couple of weeks they haven't been here i took care of all these customers without them and they go, you know what? I didn't need his input on how to run this business. I did it for him. And now he's trying to tell me how to run it whenever he's not even here. So put it to in the chat if that example gives some clarity there. 
on what happens with repair shops. And that right there is the classic example on why everyone is afraid to hire because they say they're going to leave and become an owner. Um, I want to pause there real quick. Does anyone have any kind of, uh, is there any questions or anything like that or need any kind of clarity? So I wanted to, let me check in the chat real quick. I wanted to, um, I believe Larry had a question. He raised his hand and, uh, I don't know if, uh, how I, Larry, uh, Larry from Chicago land. Larry, do you have a question you wanted to ask? Um, like we can, you know, move forward. Okay, cool. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, Perfect. Um, so I wanted to pause right there. And so I want to, I want to say that has been like one of the biggest um, reasons why I struggled so much before. And if anybody knows my story, I literally had, well, I fired one of them like a week before because I found out that they, they were stealing or whatever, but I had three employees walk out all at the same time. It was supposed to be four, but luckily I fired one. So, and I had four employees essentially walk out all at the same time. And I looked back and I wanted to blame all the employees because I could find very valid reasons why they were stealing, why they weren't actually working well, why they didn't actually like me. When I look back at it, I'm like, where did I go wrong? And it took a long time to get to the point of full acceptance that I created that whole environment. But it was from the very beginning, I hired them because I said they already knew how to do the job. And then after a while, as I learned more about business, I was like, man, I need to step as a, up as a leader and help these people out because I can get more productivity, get them more satisfaction. But on their side, they looked at it as micromanaging because of the expectations that were set through the hiring process. And eventually they got tired of me trying to interject and then they left and now they're one of my competitors in town. So <laughs> long story short, that's what it is. Um, and, um, and we may run into that situation there. Um, but I wanted to... Um, bring in, I wanted to pause here really quickly and kind of share. So in our program, Repair Shop Accelerator, we not only teach micro soldering, but we teach also systems and SOPs and all that kind of stuff. We do it through a, a series of um, coaching calls that we hold during the week. We have a huge training portal that's all built out with, doc, with the documentation. We have a one-on-one -on -one chat, all that type of stuff. And so someone that has been inside of that container and done really, really well, I wanted to bring them on to um, I wanted to bring them in here. And I think what you'll probably have to do, we may have to make you like a panelist, I think. Um, but let me see, I'm gonna make sure. Okay, yeah. Um, Travis, um, if you are there, um, if you're able to share just a little bit about yourself and then um, kind of your perspective and experience of being inside of the program. Absolutely, Ben. Can you hear me all right? Yes, 100%. Perfect. So my name is Travis Gearing, has been talked about. I have been through the ProFixer course. Um, I actually just recently graduated earlier this month. Um, I'm located in Idaho um, and I have a single shop currently working on opening a second location as well. And a lot of that is through the help that ProFixer has brought me. So everybody, when you uh, think about a course, you know, there's a lot of options out there that you can go and learn micro soldering. Um, what kind of drew me to the Pro Fixer course was not only could I go and learn micro soldering, but I could get business mentorship. Um, and that to me was the best return on investment, right? So as a business owner, we're always looking at ROI, what's going to bring us the most value on our investment. And when I looked at the courses that were available and out there um, for inclusive training, you know, the ProFixer stood out to me because of that. So the ProFixer course includes both the Solder Accelerator program as well as the Workflow Accelerator program. And the Workflow Accelerator program really stood out to me because it's that business mentoring um, that I really wanted for myself because like many owner operators out there, I was glued to my business, right? Working six, seven days a week, 12, 14 hour days. And I thought to myself, how am I ever going to grow if I can't step away from my shop? So that right there for me was the biggest initiative to go with this course. Um, the workflow accelerator covers so many different aspects. 
So as Ben mentioned, there's two calls a week that you go through and you can sit on and they're very interactive calls, right? So you cover all of the different topics in the program, but you also have a very open dialogue. So you can talk about sales, you can talk about leadership, you can talk about standard operating procedures. Um, and the standard operating procedures, you go through creation, implementation, and how to ensure follow through with both yourself and your team. You know, you talk about other things like training, human resources, organization in your store, right? Where's this phone? How does this phone get put together? All of that stuff is included in these standard operating procedures, but the course will literally take you through, build and implement in your own store. The end of this story really comes down to if you want more time back for yourself so that you can have the independence to go spend with your family or go open a second location, then that's the type of training that you really need. You can go sit in a seven day course somewhere, pay thousands of dollars on a plane ticket and hotels and pay for the course and learn on somebody else's equipment. Or you can take a course where you can learn on your own equipment, be at home and get business mentoring. And that's what that, that course has really done for me. Not only have I taken my business from, you know, being able to offer a limited set of services to now a very wide set of services, but I also have given myself back the freedom that I only work four days a week and at part time that. And I'm a small shop, right? Now I have the ability that I am focused on going and opening the second location. That's really what this course has done for me. And uh, the program is world class. We, we're not going to find anything better out there. Appreciate you so much for for sharing your experience, Travis. And I have to say, like um, working with Travis, I think ever since our initial like discovery sales call that we initially did in the very beginning, like you could totally tell, just an incredibly motivated individual. Um, and uh, definitely a hard worker, but totally transformed everything because he put in the work. Um, and one thing that, um, I know we we're talking about workflow today, but one thing that was incredibly impressive, Travis set a goal to do sandwich board repairs within three weeks and he totally met it as well, along with getting his shop to the point where, you know, he was working six, seven days a week, now down to four part-time. So like massive, massive um, results. And so I appreciate uh, appreciate you sharing, Travis. So. Um, Put a one in the chat if hearing Travis's experience is um, is motivating to you guys. And so I want to say like this, you know, building out Repair Shop Accelerator, joining up with Repair Desk has really been, I would say, more or less like a passion project of my own is because I, I was really at one point I was so burnt out, even though I fixed my repair shop and it was working, like all those scars of just like having been overworked and just seeing repairs just reminded me of like how bad it had been. And I was like, man, maybe I should change industries. Maybe I should go try something else out. Um, but sharing um, some advice in the Facebook groups and things like that inspired me to um, reach out and help other repair shops. And it's been an incredible experience now at this point to, you know, have people like Travis where, you know, my story, despite it sounding awful, like in just like a bad time, you know, but the triumph over all of that has been able to help other people and so it's been been an incredible experience to really see people uh see people grow um does anyone have any kind of questions or anything like that at this point um i can see one question travis have you seen an increase in revenue and profit although i can see that in your repairs account but yeah would love travis to answer <laughs> yeah absolutely i i've definitely seen uh, a huge increase in, in a couple of different ways, right? One from being able to manage my team more effectively and make sure that time is being well spent because I have standard operating procedures in place now that my team follows. So a, a really quick, good story to share with you here, right? I, I had an employee before, the, before I took this course, an employee that started on phone towards the end of the evening, left the phone unfinished on his work mat the next day I came in, the next day when I had a newer employee come in, looked at the phone, saw everything scattered and thought to themselves, I'm not going to touch this phone. Three days later, when the original employee came back, the phone was still unfinished. So now not only do we have voicemails and text messages and calls from this customer during those three day 
three days, but I'm getting blown up as well going, why is this phone not finished? I'm mad. I want my phone back. And so the moral of the story here is I'm pretty sure every person on this call at some point may have experienced something like that. When you have systems and processes in place, any tech can come in behind another tech and pick up exactly where they left off because everybody does it the exact same way. And just that piece of it has allowed my store to be able to efficiently handle and get through everything seamlessly. So that's just on the business side of it, right? And it's being able to handle my business and the operations. On the soldering side of it, I've also seen tremendous growth because now I can take on projects that I never could do before. Um, and, and so, yeah, I've seen tremendous growth from the program. Awesome. Mic drop. So, <laughs> so yeah, amazing. And I got to say, Tim, so Tim Vanderklok has been in our program too. And then uh, Kevin has been in our program and I see a couple other people too. And so um, phenomenal, phenomenal results. And that's been one of the most motivating things is like, you know, sometimes starting something, you know, you look at it, and you're like, well, you know, I can like share stuff, but like the real value has come from the community that we've created. Like you hear Travis talking, like, those that's his literal experience and one of the great things about our calls is we have right now 170 people in our program right now just in like our community that's grown from everyone that's channeled through um and the really great thing about being on the calls with those people or being in the facebook with those people is those people have gone through like transformation experiences where it's not like oh they bought a product and sold it and made some profit but it's like no like being in our program is not for everyone. Like you have to be a high achiever and motivated to make the proper change and really get the results. And so like everyone that is in there is absolutely amazing. And so that's been one of the huge parts is, you know, for, for me included, like my business has increased because now we have a gazillion people in there that they share their experience and their, their perspective where they go, Hey, like I've been doing this and it's been working or, Hey, I've been doing that. And it's like, wow, that's totally like the other facet that I wasn't seeing before because of just the, my perspective. And now I see from their perspective and it totally gives you like that full circle um, perspective on everything. Um, yeah, a question from Rahim. Uh, what are the negatives? Um, ben or Travis, I mean, if you... Um, oh, okay. So, yeah, so... Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm 100% being transparent. If Travis or Matt or wants to share any negatives from my perspective, like, uh, you know, from my side, you know, I, I'm in programs as well that are very similar to the structure. And I'll say, like, one of the negatives um, from that is it, it is very hard. And one of the big things that you'll probably notice up front is our program is a 90 day program. So it's three months. Um, you know, for the very first couple of weeks, you're probably going to be incredibly motivated. You're going to be like on a really big high and then you'll probably hit like a brick wall because you'll become overwhelmed. You may actually like burn out a little bit because you're like, I've been doing double the work, trying to make all these changes. Some of it's working, some of it's not. And I feel like I'm at a loss right now because you look at your time ticking and you're like, oh my gosh, I have 70 days left in the program or whatever it may be. And it's very difficult. And I felt that the same way and some other things that have been too. And so, you know, I guess the, you know, the negatives is that could be overwhelming but the you know positive to that is we have four coaches instead of our program we have multiple you know one-on-one you know access to us and things like that so you know very very good ways that you can uh, you know find a solution to it but at the same time it's, it's definitely hard work but um yeah 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 barry we'll, we'll do an sop i got a framework for that so Um, let's see here. So Lena, how do you keep your learners motivated when they can't immediately see the impact of their learning? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge one. So I think with consistency with anything, I think there is, it's almost like imposter syndrome as well. You know, I think, you know, especially in the, in the service industry, like repair shops, a lot of us have opened up repair shops because we almost feel like the black sheep. We, we didn't fit into college. We didn't fit into a regular job. Maybe we're just a little too crazy minded to like fit into the mold of everything else. And so we kind of settled down into, you know, service industry, whether it's like repair, like, you know, stuff in repair shops or whatnot. Um, and so 
it, it can be kind of hard because we look at everything, it's everything's been on a shoestring budget and, and all that kind of stuff. And so as we bring people onto our program, sometimes that stuff can reflect onto them where you know, it can be very hard. But the biggest thing that I've seen to keep us motivated and you know, for one, like if you're succeeding in business, it's all the consistency um, that realistically, it's not the mountain that gets in your way. It's the pebble that's inside of your shoe that prevents you from ascending to the peak. Um, and so the same thing with your employees, their motivation isn't because the workload is too big. It's not because of customers are difficult to talk to. It's because of the pebble inside of their shoe to say, hey, I understand that you're overwhelmed. Let me help understand where you're coming from and let's build a really good script on how to discuss with the customer that one thing that's kind of stressing you out because I know you get stressed out when talking about prices with the customer before we take it in. Let me help you gain some clarity and maybe we can make some scripts on how to best deliver that so that you're not so overwhelmed. And the big thing to realize is you are their mentors. They spend more time with you most likely than they do with their own family. And that's the big empowerment and satisfaction of being able to create, SO, create SOPs that create the structure to create the um, success is we can either bring them into our business, point out everything they did wrong, tell them they took out the trash wrong, right? Or we can give them the exact game plan on how to do that. And then they go home and they tell their family, dude, at work today, like we, I, I was talking with a customer, we have this amazing script that's awesome and like nailing it, getting so many sales. Or they're like, dude, had all these devices come in? I fixed five in like an hour. How amazing is that? And they go home proud versus going home and being like, dude, my boss was like freaking out about the trash. Like, how dumb is that? And that right there, we look at it as, no, I was wanting this place to be clean, but on their side, they're like, he was freaking about nothing. And that's how we can keep them motivated is to realize we can either empower them through the consistency of reducing those pebbles that are in their shoes versus trying to change the whole mountain for them. You know, just look at the very small things and be consistent for it. Uh, ben, um, is it possible that uh, I, I know um, uh, you know we, we are um, short on time? I mean, we yeah. are spending 15, 30 minutes. Is it possible if we can do a quick walkthrough on, let's say, you know, uh, if someone is interested in learning more about the course, mm -hmm. um, how does the process looks like? And but before that, perhaps do a quick uh, overview of first 30 days in the course, or perhaps do a screen share if possible where you can walk through, you know, uh, what does it look like to be part of your program? Obviously, we're not trying to sell the uh, sell Ben program. We are just trying to educate our, uh, our audience that uh, what's in it for them. Um, obviously, it comes with a price tag, but uh, I personally see that if I was running a repair shop, I'll definitely do something like this because um, uh, like I mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning that I spend a lot of time, money in uh, developing um, a lot of features, which probably not a lot of our customers use. And if we can, um, and if we can, you know, share the same, uh, the same way I think and I operate with the rest of my team uh, by creating SOPs, uh, then uh, probably we'll, 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 we can avoid these uh, problems moving forward. So yeah, uh, over sure. to you, Ben. Yeah, for sure. So let me screen share real quick and I'll share what our program looks like on the inside. So, um, so to kind of give the, and, and also for, I think it was, was it Barry? I think it was, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we'll show an SOP after that. So for everyone, for the time commitment of an hour, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up in that aspect. And then for anyone that's to stick around for 15 minutes or so, then we'll show the, uh, the other side of it too. So, um, and also I do have one other guest speaker or guest, um, experience. Um, that I wanted to share with Matt and we'll share that after I share what our program looks like and then we'll we'll jump into our, to our thing here. So, um, so let me pull this up on this side and then we'll, uh, okay, cool. So inside of our program, we have a couple different um, aspects of, you know, how we do things. So we have four key elements of resources. So our first one is going to be our training portal, which is this right here. So our training portal consists of um, all these courses here, and they have um, phase one, phase two, phase three, pertaining to our soldering program, phase one, phase two, phase three of our work program. Um, we have a Nintendo Switch into Lite, and uh, we have our legacy programs here. We have our console program, Intro to Soldering. 
and this other one here is a, is a free one. It's a, it's an iPad one in the next page. I won't click it because it'll refresh it. Um, but inside of each one of these, we break down everything into sizable bytes that you're able to um, process through. So inside of a program, this is like the best part because as a repair shop, you're incredibly busy and we don't want to like dictate what your whole day looks like because it can become very overwhelming, especially over 90 days. So we give this to you as like the textbook where you're able to log in, go through this process as it best fits your schedule. Then what you do, you come to the calls with us, which we hold those calls um, four times per week. We hold two soldering calls, two workflow calls. And on those calls, we, um, we're we then able to discuss like an open dialogue, like what Travis was saying, very similar. I would say very similar to this call here. Um, and we discuss what you're working on, how it's going, how the implementation is working out. And we, we really resolve those types of issues for you there. Um, we record every single one of those calls. We upload those later so you can use those as resources to review or to look at past calls that maybe we covered a particular topic that you're wanting to look more into. We have over a year's worth of those types of calls now. Even on the soldering side, we have deep diagnostic workflow calls that we go through as well as basic foundational calls that we go through and we record every single one of those. Apart from those two there, so you work in the training portal, come to our calls to get clarity. In between those call times, you still need help. So we have our Facebook group, which is Lifetime Community. You can post in there. All the members are vetted. Also, we have our one-on-one -on -one messenger channel, which is literally just you and then four members of my team, where at any given time, you know, realistically throughout the day, you're able to message us and get clarity and understanding on what it may be to kind of fill in the gap during in between those calls. And also for accountability, we have two people that we've brought on specifically as um, what we call success and accountability coaches. And if you ask anybody, if you ask Travis or Tim or anyone like that here, or Matt, we reach out to you proactively to say, hey, glad to see you on the call. Like, what goals do you have this week? What goals should we set? Oh, you don't have goals. How is that goal going for you? Reach out back out to you about every two to three days to make sure everything's followed up on. So very interactive experience, be very motivating for you and empowering. And also the big thing that you'll see as well, that there's a very human element there. Like we talk with some people that, they then realize they're like, man, I want more out of my business. I have no family time. My kids are never seeing me. Like I never see them. Like, and we can really empathize with them at that point to say, hey, like, let's figure out something for that. We can talk to them on a personal level. We, we even had somebody where they were having an argument with their spouse because their spouse was working way too long and wanting them to work as well because their business wasn't doing good and wasn't really coming to the calls to really get the work, help that they needed. And we're able to like, help them and discuss with them like on a really personal level. And so it's not just like, hey, work, 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 implement, implement and get the results. It's like, hey, like we see that you're a human. We wanna connect with you. Like how can we best help you through your stuff? And um, and it's been a very personal experience. So that's that's really like the four main elements of resources in our program. But that's that's like the, uh, the base overview of that. We do that for a 90 day period. And then you're able to stay inside of our community for a lifetime. So, um, and also keep access to that training portal that I shared. You have access to that for life, so. Um, does anyone have any kind of, um, any questions or anything like that about, about that structure or any kind of questions that come to that? Cool. Um, put a one in the chat. If that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you inside of your business. Perfect. So, um, so I do see in there to be transparent with the cost and things like that. So if it's a good fit, we want to share with you the cost and things. Um, but being that we're a 90 day program, we do want to make sure that our program is exactly the right fit, that we can solve your problems, that we can really help you. So what I best recommend for everyone to do is if you're interested in the program, want to know price, want to know like, you know, more detailed features and really how we help people, um, go to that many chat link it'll get you into our chat bot and it'll queue you in there and then that way either myself or one of our team members can reach out and then we can uh, discuss all of that with you but more so than the cost we can discuss like if it actually would help and benefit you so that's what we want to do um what and i wanted to share one more um person in here before we kind of roll into the next part of it and we're kind of at the tail end of this so we're kind of wrapping it all up but Matt, um, Matt, if you're able to, um, let me find you in here and I'll, there we go, I'll put you in the top there. So there you go. Um, so Matt came into our program um, a couple months ago as well. Um, and he's been doing phenomenally um, with soldering as well as workflow. And, um, and it's been really incredible to be able to see like his progress over time. So that's one reason why I reached out to Matt. He's, 
He's actually been one of our guest presenters on our workflow calls, as well as Travis too. Like I gotta say Travis, like these two individuals have been absolutely amazing. Um, so one of the funny things, uh, Travis, I don't mind me sharing, but like, it's awesome because you'll get a question of the workflow calls and then I'll see Travis's uh, mute thing turn off and he's ready to like share his input. And so it's been really valuable. And Matt, the same way Matt um, actually hosted one of our workflow calls and taught on it, on the communication channel and how to set that up and things. And so these two people are, are amazing. So um, Matt, if you can um, if you can share just a little bit about yourself and kind of what the program has done for you, your experience in it. Uh, so my name is Matt. Uh, I've been in the industry, well, mobile industry for like six years, since like 2015. Um, and then I was in IT before that. So I've been in the industry for quite a while. Um, but I had a lot of trouble with like staying on task and like keeping things organized um, and like trouble with callbacks and stuff like that. And even with like accessory sales and stuff, uh, which I don't even know that I've really talked about about that stuff, but uh, the SOPs and like Ben's uh, way of like pitching accessories and stuff has like really like changed everything. Um, and it's even changed stuff in my personal life as well. Uh, I've like implemented SOPs in my personal life as well with my uh, significant other. And she's really like taken on the SOP stuff as well. And is like trying to get them implemented at her job and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, like Ben's love of SOPs, like, you know, exudes out and oozes out into everybody and everything. And uh, yeah, the program is extremely beneficial um, just from like the workflow aspect. I think a lot of people join the uh, the course, you know, thinking, oh yeah, okay, cool. I'm going to be able to solder now. You know, I'm going to do some audio ICs, maybe split some sandwich boards. Like this is going to be cool. But then hopefully they show up to the workflow call and it kind of changes everything in my opinion. Uh, like you kind of realign yourself a little bit and it really like makes things a lot smoother and the, the, um, the openness and the vulnerability in the workflow calls is so like refreshing and um, just like, it, it's great, it's really great. We all share very openly, um, you know, even if you're having a problem, you can kind of share with the group and people are gonna have real solutions that are going to work for you. Um, and just always, you know, someone to listen, you know, that helps too. Um, but yeah, the, the, the program definitely, uh, I know not talking about price and whatnot, but it's definitely worth the price <laughs> and I highly recommend it for sure. Appreciate you sharing that. Put a one in the chat up here and Matt's experience is refreshing to you guys. If that's, uh, if that's beneficial to you. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing Matt. So, um, so what questions does everyone have as far as the, um, as far as what we've talked about so far, I did want to go into to answer any questions about that. If you do we want to go into how to build an SOP, like my simple framework for that. Um, we'll roll into that next. Cool. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and then so to, to get the expectations for this here, we're going to take uh, maybe about 15 minutes to um, share how to build an SOP, how to use the communication channel best to your benefit through that. And then um, and then we'll just um, then we'll just end the we'll end the call after that. And Usman has a couple announcements as far as uh, the freedom plan and, and all that kind of stuff. And then also with, with our program too, we'll, uh, we'll share that. So, um, to let me spotlight myself. So it's the biggest, and then I'll share my screen here real quick. All right, cool. Make sure I got it pulled up. Okay, cool. Yeah, we do. There we go. All right. So inside of our program, just to kind of give you like an idea of what SOPs look like, um, this right here is our owner manager handbook. This thing is um, 72 pages long. 
essentially this contains all of the trainings, all of the implementation on how to actually understand SOPs, the implementation of them, and the best way to get the most out of them in your store. And so in here, you know, of course we cover, you know, some of it on the workflow calls because it's very easy to cover dynamically at that point. Um, but here inside of a manual, like we, this has all of my trainings on here with an index. So, you know, what is an SOP becoming a leader, common sense is killing your business, one-two communication, uh, strategy tactic with team meetings, training implementation, all that kind of stuff that I cover in here. And we break it all down into, into bookmarked little areas. And this is something that I do share with everyone um, inside of my program. And they can literally copy and paste this as their own and then modify it to best fit their needs for like different nuances with the wording and things like that. Um, the other one that we have is going to be our team member handbook. So the team member handbook is literally what your team will use in order to carry out the day to day. So of course we have in here like the general guidelines, but the general guidelines is literally like taken out of the trash and like all that kind of stuff. But it, it, it just kind of outlines like what should be done, arrive on departure times, what that looks like, like how many minutes are they allotted? That way you don't just have like, oh yeah, you're cool. Just come in as long as you don't have anything, you know, too late or whatever. I don't know, you know, like it's sometimes a little too loose where it's like, hey, let's just set some times and let's just adhere to those times. Um, personal hygiene, that way, if you do notice that somebody is a little bit stinky or whatever, you can uh, have already referenced this and it'd be very clear. Um, we don't do any kind of smoking, vaping, drinking, anything like that. We have a certain place for to park in the parking lot, according to the, the landlord, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but really where it gets down into this is we break down, you know, really what it looks like for a repair shop to, uh, to use this. And so we have what we call phase four, which is our vehicle for all the SOPs, which is essentially block scheduling, tells everyone what to do, what not to do at any given time of the day, along with all the particular SOPs with that. And then even down in here. So as far as like, um, um, even in the event like where we have a warranty come back, accidental damage, we have this specific process that should be followed with each and every single one of these. And this just goes down for literally everything in the repair shop. And the way that I identified this is what I'm going to share next with our communication channel. Um, so the communication channel is one of those things that we um, that I've really relied on heavily in order to understand where my business is at the moment. Um, too many times we look at things and we try to create solutions to things that aren't actually a problem, but the communication channel is going to highlight all of the problems in your business. I'll put a one in the chat if that makes sense. So the communication channel will highlight all the problems in your business. And so here, I mean, there's 54 pages of all this, but like it just goes down through here with, you know, all these different items, even how to reconcile the work orders. Um, and then even like violation of expected responsibilities, daily task reporting, repair times, all that kind of stuff. Um, even commissions and all those types of things too. Um, so one of the things that we do is we run everything through our communication channel. And our communication channel is something that'll give you massive clarity. So inside of Slack, I'm actually gonna include um, in here as well. So everybody that registered for the webinar, we're gonna send it out to them. So it should be out to you a little bit later today, um, but it'd be an outline of you know what we talked about here on this call. But the big thing is we wanna be able to build a um, communication channel. A communication channel is going to serve as like the centralized communication. We report everything through there. Um, some of the things through our communication channel that we have built is we have different channels inside of there for our cash store accounts. We have diagnostic help. We have general. We have inventory. We have if the door's been locked, we have one specifically for that. We have one called phase four, which is kind of what I showed you at the beginning of that thing there. That's something that we use. It's like a system that we use. Um, and then we have store devices, and then we have what's called unknown items. But essentially what we did is we broke it down into a couple different you know, categories as far as what we normally see in our repair shop. That way we can have very, very systemized um, discussion on whatever topic it may be. All the discussion that we do in our business goes through here. Um, so of course, like if you ask them how their day is, you don't have to type it into the Slack as well. But if you have a device that needs a two-tech check, you send a message through our channel you can tell someone as well to say, hey, this needs to be two tech check, but you send it through a channel to make sure that they see that. Also, any of the questions that you have in there in the unknown items or in your general tab, um, those are going to be questions from your team. So they'll be like, hey, what is the price for a Samsung S22, right? That right there would be like, well, cool. That right there might be something I want to create an SOP on how to price or do I need to create a price sheet or do I need to make this updated for that? Um, and we may get questions on, hey, where is the extra isopropyl alcohol? Or, hey, where is that one device that we were working on yesterday? 
oh, hey, does anyone have an extra lightning cable? I don't have one on my workbench. You know, like things like that will go through that communication channel, but they'll give you the opportunity to be able to see where the high points are in your business for where the most like, like the most unknown things are. Um, put a two in the chat if that makes sense. Because if they, and if you have, if you require them to work through your communication channel, that's the most important. Um, because even though they can ask you in person, one of the big things with that is you may forget you may not really understand what they meant, or it makes it very hard to go back and track it because you'll forget about it. So the thing is, if they're sending it through the communication channel, even if they're sitting right next to me working at a workbench and they're like, hey, we ran out of isopropyl alcohol, I'm not gonna say, oh, cool, I'll just go pick some up tomorrow. I'm gonna say, awesome, drop that in the inventory tab so I can have that in there. And then when you scroll back to the inventory tab, you're like, dude, it looks like we're always running out of isopropyl and we always are without it. Maybe I need to keep better tabs on how many we should have in stock at any given time. There, right there, we have reduced the, um, you know, we've reduced the bottleneck that we experience in our store because instead of running into that, having to jump out of the store, you know, not eat lunch that day or just have to go run and go get that, I'm able to have planned a week before to already have it. Then in place of running around with a chicken with a head cut off that day, maybe I can go surprise my kid at school with lunch. Maybe I can go drop by the house for, you know, two, three hours during lunch to go surprise my wife, you know, whatever it may be like, you know, you can do those things because you're not filling your day with all these like random, like things that could have already been done. Um, and that's how we build out the, um, the urgency on what we need to work with. But there is a formula that I work with on that, but put a one in the chat, that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions on how the communication channel works? Perfect. Um, if anyone has any questions, just type it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll take that. But one of the things with this is actually it's the page. And so if anyone is wondering, we do have an SOP that we built for this webinar today. So, <laughs> so SOPs for that, um, SOPs for inside a profixer, SOPs like on how to create zoom calls, all that kind of stuff. So everything goes very, very well. So you can never have enough SOPs. Uh, the only time an SOP is bad, if you try to spring on someone after the fact, you always want to preface that SOPs are always in place. Um, and that's really how we, uh, how we work on this. So, um, so, uh, so the, so the method that we follow for, um, our framework of SOPs is we call it our ERP method. So our ERP method means efficient, repeatable, and profitable. Um, that right there is kind of my qualifiers for what um, would be able to be created as an SOP. Um, so first of all, um, it has to be an efficient process that you need to be able to do very easily, that anyone can do it. If it's too complex and someone's going to make a mistake, maybe you need to figure out a better way to do it. So it has to be efficient. Um, number two, it has to be repeatable. Can somebody else just repeat this just as easily as another? And also, are we going to run into this issue enough times to really even care about it? Sure, like maybe taking out the trash, we do that every single day. So yeah, we have an efficient way to do that. It's taken out every single day, so it's not too heavy. Repeatable, but we do it every single day. And then profitable, uh, not like too much like dollar amount being made off taking out the trash. However, if, the, if, if it's reducing the bottleneck where now your employee is no longer trying to figure out things to do whenever they're slow, like, and waiting for the time when they're slow to take out the trash, they take it out to the end of the night, then during the day when they find those slow times, they go, oh yeah, I need to work on those buyback devices that we got. Oh yeah, I need to call those customers to get them to come pick up their devices and pay the rest of the money that they already had pre-authorized. You know, that would become the kind of more profitable part of it. And we may not look at it too directly because, oh, taking out the trash is too simple. It doesn't make you money, but realistically it does because it then took the trash that normally would be taken out during a slow time. It now makes you take it out while you're walking out to your car um, as to leave the business. And now in the middle of the day, you have more free time available to work on profitable tasks. So put a two in the chat, if that makes sense there. So even in the trash, it, even the trash guideline, it follows all of these here, which is very, very important. Um, but we call it our ERP method, our efficient, repeatable, profitable. And that's like our, our framework there. So in any of these here, what we do is we want to, um, whenever we build an SOP, we want to state the summary of the SOP and then we want to define the steps and then we want to add clarification if any and then we want to add an action item to that so that's kind of my four-step process to building an sop 
So um, you state the summary of the SOP, meaning in this particular document or in this SOP, we're gonna cover this or that or this. Here are the steps. Here's the clarification, if any, as far as like, you know, be careful with step number three, because you may think you need to do it this way, but it's stated to do it this way because of whatever. And um, action item, report to or send message to Slack or, you know, notify someone or do something like that. It gets them to take that action to be accountable for that process. I'll put a one in the chat if that makes sense there. It's a very, very simple, simple framework here. Um, I have copied over, let me see what I actually pulled. I pulled some of our trainings from our um, manager, owner manager, um, the uh, owner manager um, doc. Um, but some of the other ones that I can pull as well are going to be, for instance, let me pull it up really quick and I'll show you so you can kind of see this. Is there any particular one? So where is, let's actually make this pretty, uh, pretty dynamic. So where is one place that you are? Oh, clarification, action item. Javante, it's action item. So after you've added the clarifying steps, if any, if it needs to be clarified to be more specific to say, hey, watch out for number three, because you'll probably make a mistake and this is why, then number four, then you're going to want to add in there the action item. Take this step to report to somebody or to put the device here or to do that. You know, it's the action item to like make it come full circle. All right, cool. So um, where is it, let's make this pretty dynamic for everyone and we'll, we'll wrap up with this here. So um, I want everyone to be able to, I think it's important to kind of, you know, go through the process yourself. And so let's do that. So I will copy and paste a handful of my SOPs that are inside of my manual. I'll send those to you whenever we send it out with Usman after this call. Um, yeah, I can share, let me just share my screen here real quick and I'll just show you. And then um, I will share a couple of these SOPs directly with you guys. Um, but we'll go there. So this is phase four. That's not quite an SOP because it's the structure for all the SOPs. Um, well, warranty periods, it's more of a guideline. Okay, cool. So like warranty, warranty right here. So this is gonna be a warranty one. So like, let's say you get an item back and it's DOA. So this doesn't really seem to be that big of an issue anymore. This is like a big issue back in the day, but, um, <laughs> um, but now you don't really get too many DOA devices or, or screens or anything like that. Um, so this right here is the action. This right here would be like the clarification action item. It doesn't follow that same um, um, order, but it, but it's all within the same thing here. So, um, so basically we have the title and then we have the summary. So this is uh, that arrived bad at a box or found to be dead um, before installation. So if a part is physically broken, let the proper person know immediately. So the steps on this one, if the part is bound to be suitable for use, um, then the part needs to have all original plastic coverings intact to be placed back in the same bubble bag or box it came in. Uh, fill out the white warranty DOA sheet, which is found here, um, and fill it out with all appropriate sections, so the brief but specific information as to why the part is bad. Place part in warranty DOA section with proper form attached. Um, and so these here are, you know, that format there. And these are pretty, uh, and these, you may look at this and say, well, that's very obvious. Like if it's broken, obviously you need to tell your manager, but I'll tell you like, some people just don't know. And you just gotta outline it for them to make sure that makes sense. Um, warranty DOA accessories, even though it's very similar, we just made the process specific for that. Um, one of the things that I have seen people do, and it's pretty impressive, but you can take screenshots and make everything kind of like a line, like, you know, be like in a flow chart, which is really cool. Um, but I haven't found that to be any more of an advantage for um, my team to understand how to follow it. So we don't really follow that particular process of SOP creation, um, which can be nice, um, but it seems like it takes up more of my time whenever the clarity on their end is exactly the same. So we just use text format for most everything, unless we need a picture like down here like that. 
Um, ben, there's a question from Pete in the Q&A. Um, uh, can you check that out? Hey, Peter, yeah. So, um, so yes, you can get full access to all of our SOPs by joining our program. So that's kind of, you know, what we do. We keep that exclusive to everyone that um, joins our program. To do that, um, Usman, if you can go through there and get that mini chat link, copy and paste it again. And that way, if Peter joined afterwards, he can still see that and then connect with us. Um, and even right here, we have like repairs that take more than one sitting, because I noticed that sometimes we run into that. And it's kind of funny because this right here is really a result of, uh, of not charging bench fees and pre-authorizing up front. This is like a, this is, I remember this is one of my first SOPs that I created, um, but we still have it there just in case. And then um, device that's pulled apart to test another, um, if you ever have to do that. Um, and then we have our process for a couple of other things as far as like front counter check-in um, with each and every, you know, piece of that creation that goes on with the clarification that happens at each one of these. Um, end of day point of sale. Uh, this just uh, you know talks about how to close down for the end of the day. Also, how to talk with customers. This is kind of long. It using the index is a little bit easier. You can so you can click on it. And it takes you directly there. So let me actually go back up. So this is a pretty good one that you guys can create for yourself. Answering using the phone. Is this one it? Yeah. So this right here. It, follows that same method. This is a little bit longer and drawn out, right? Because it's a uh, more dialogue and things than just like the four points can really handle. Um, but it still has the same thing here. We have the summary at the very beginning. We have the step by steps going through here. And then, you know, this is the clarification there. Phrases in red are necessary. So things in orange, like, you know, of course are like the annotations to it, but they need to say this in the specific way. And I always say like with a smile on your face, eagerness in your voice, we want to make it sound a certain way. So you have to be able to figure that out on how to best translate that to your team. Um, we have, and yeah. I have a follow-up question. Uh, I mean, uh, on I mean, you mentioned about answering your phone. So let's say if the repair is completed, uh, obviously, I mean, in service business, reviews are very important. Uh, how do you go about, or what do you recommend repair shops to do over there? To get more reviews yeah so um to get more reviews um we actually do a thing called call and text follow-up um which um which one of the things before i go to that so whenever you're on a call with somebody we have a little short code that we can send out on our phone so if they are like yeah i'm gonna come by um or like awesome let me send you the address after we get off the call we just send a little short code and it drops our address in there as a text uh, that way you have a second form of communication with them you have the call plus text which is kind of cool so we have a thing called call and text follow-up. So this is how we get more reviews. So uh, call and text follow-up. Okay, cool. So call and text follow-up is actually something that I created talking with my brother who did real estate. And I was like, man, how can I drive more people? He did real estate, but also did SEO on the side. And I was like, hey man, like when you get some SEO going and get all this stuff. And he's like, well, I don't know. Let's figure something out organic first because organic base and then SEO on top works really, really well. And then um, and he's like, you probably just need to call your customers. And I'm like, like, what do you mean? He's like, you need to call them and just, you know, see how their service was. So what we do is we actually do a call and text follow-up. This right here shows you how to run the report, which we can skip over that. But the call and text follow-up script, the basis behind it is one to two weeks after a repair has been done, we literally call every single customer. And I have on the phone at work, it is a video of myself where I've literally recorded it. And I've said, hi, my name is Ben Rosso. I wanted to thank you for coming by uh, Gadgetmatic Express recently and, and uh, purchasing products and services from us. I was just doing a quick follow-up to see if you had any questions about your repair or if there's anything I can do for you. Um, feel free to respond to this message as a text or give me a call at 903. And that's literally what we do. And so. We, it sounds crazy, but we literally send that video out to every single customer. So what we do is we call them. If they pick up the phone, we have a regular discussion with them and say that same thing. We say, hey, I just wanna thank you for coming by. 
our store recently? How has everything been going for you? It's going to throw them off because no one calls anyone nowadays for things like that, especially a small business. If they don't pick up because they're in a meeting and a lot of people screen their calls, like I don't answer my phone ever. I just wait for it to get a voicemail or them to text me or whatever. So like the, you know, you send a video and they're like, wait, what's, what's the video for? And they're like, oh, it's the dude from the repair shop. That's weird. And they listen to it like, oh, he wants to know how it's going. Oh yeah, my home button was kind of weird. And then they're like, oh yeah, we caught a warranty before they complained about it to hundred people or before they dealt with it and they were able to come back and then get a screen protector because maybe they get the screen protector, we fix the home button under warranty. Um, as well, what we do for the reviews at that point is um, we, um, we send them a, so after the, so on the call or through the text, we say, hey, I wanted to send you a discount and also a link to leave a review if they said that they had a good experience. So if you're like, I just wonder how it's going for you. Oh, it's going great. Phone's working perfectly. Say, hey, that's awesome. I wanted to um, give you a discount actually on anything else that you need. Plus, um, I wanted to ask if you would be able to post, you know, your experience with this as a review on our Google page. If I sent that to you in an email, would that be okay? And the customer's like, yeah, sure. So you get their email, send it to them, and then boom. You kind of kill two birds with one stone at that point. But the biggest thing with it is too often, this goes off into a whole nother tangent, but too often we try to find new customers all the time and we never worry about our existing customers. And so that's the biggest thing is we want to work with our current existing base and make them super, super, super sticky and build that trust so that it will never leave us because people don't argue with those that they trust. So if we can build that trust, we can run into issues. Like I'll tell you, we're not a perfect repair shop. We're not bad at all, but we're not perfect just like everyone else. And if we make a mistake or we have to hold a customer's phone overnight, because maybe the one screen that we ordered in, we broke it during install, or maybe we busted off the FPC and we had to solder it and it took, you know, whatever. Um, customers aren't upset. I mean, they're kind of like weirded out a little bit, like, ah, inconvenience, but they're not like giving us bad reviews. They're not like, you know, you know, doing all those types of things. And so that's what we do to get more reviews um, is we do our call and text follow-up um, to gather their email address and then send that back out to them that way. And that right there, I want to say is the way that you're able to keep your team involved positively and empowered throughout the day to be a vital part of the business that literally if you hire them and you're just like, I don't know, just if a phone comes in, fix it. Like <laughs> that's kind of what, we, what most repair shop owners do. But if you're like, oh, cool. The hierarchy of all this is we fix phones as they come in. Once we've fixed all those devices, then what we're going to do according to phase four is we are now going to um, do our call and text follow-up as well. We need to call back some of these customers that have left some devices and not picked them up yet. Once you're done with that, um, then at that point, we're going to do this where it's reaching out to customers and it gives them an empowering time in the day to engage versus to deflect. Too often we say, oh, if you're kind of slow, I guess kind of mop or take out the trash or something like that, where it's like, no, 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 that should be done at a specific time of the day. What should we do during the day? It's like, oh, cool. So you're done with doing devices the next most important thing to do is calling customers. The next most empowering thing you can do is following up. The next most empowering thing you can do is this. And you'll find that your team all of a sudden doesn't look at the slow times in the day as like, ah, cool, nothing to do now. They look at it as like, cool, I'm, I'm staying engaged. I'm staying positive. I'm staying empowered because I have the game plan to win and I'm just following the process. And so that's like the whole culture shift with it. I'll put a one in the chat that makes sense there as far as like that, uh, you know, that culture shift that you can create by empowering them to fill the times in the day with your leadership um, versus telling them to mop the floor. <laughs> like it's, it's so demeaning to be like, oh, we're slow, go ahead and mop the floor. You know, like, it's like, I don't know, it's like the worst thing ever. Um, cool, but does anyone have any questions as far as, as far as that goes? Um, so what is one area that is, so we'll, we'll end with, we'll end with this and then I'll turn the time over to Usman to, um, announce a little bit about their freedom plan and things like that. Um, but, uh, but what is one area in your business and go ahead and type in the chat that you're wanting to create an SOP around? Like what is an area that you find yourself having to tend to, and it's an inconvenience. So are you having to make prices for your team? Is your team having to have you step in to explain the warranty process? Or are you running into issues where the work orders aren't filled out properly or whatever it is? Perfect. So Frank, I would, I would break down what is one, what is the 
most hot one of those that's like the the one that says grind your gears the most one that inconveniences the most that we'll start an sop there like pickups inventory okay cool so ashley is upsells and bolt-ons very nice workbench cleanliness very nice communication with the in-store customers perfect okay cool so um I'm actually gonna type this all out on my worksheet. And then once I finalize all this afterwards, then we'll, uh, I'll show you how easy it is to make an SOP. So the hard part with SOPs is actually implementing it. That's the hard part. So <laughs> SOPs are easy to create. Getting your team all on the same page, that's where, that's where it is a little bit harder, but definitely doable. Here we go. I'm gonna share my screen real quick and then we'll uh, we'll go there. Okay, cool, let me open up my chat so I can see what's going on there. Mailing out items for RMA or B2B work. Okay, cool, so workbench cleanliness, communication with in-store customers, pickups, inventory, up sales, bolt-ons. Okay, cool, so put a one in the chat if, if if when you do these processes, you it, it's successful. So like if you do an upsell or bolt on, it works. Frank, if you do this stuff in the middle of the day, it works. Like you just know how to do it and it works fine. But when an employee tries to do it, it's like, that's the hurdle. Okay, cool, it's 0.5. So, um, so what we wanna do is, what we wanna do is we want to write out the way that we do these things. So I can kind of, and just for time's sake, um, can't go you know too deep into each one but if i was taking on each one of these to kind of give you an idea with this is um upsells and bolt-ons so what we need to do at that point is we need to say okay cool what was the activity before that that had to take place before we start talking about the upsells and when do we talk about that so the way that we talk about it in our store is um, during the intake process of the device as we're checking the two tech check um you know the the preliminary testing on the device we then mention um, we ask questions um, to kind of spark the idea with um, with sales. And so that all comes from like a sales script, which is just like an opener, which is to establish trust. And so um, the way that we do that is um, during this, I would add a line on here, which would say, um, you can put it here, like below is the process we follow to keep the customer engaged and motivated to protect their device with the accessories that we offer. Okay, cool. So that's like the, uh, you know, I'm gonna space it down a little bit so we can be on the same page. Okay, cool. Um, that's like the, uh, you know, a little summary, right? Um, this right here would be efficient, repeatable, profitable because it's going to be efficient because we should be able to do this with every single customer. Repeatable, you know, every customer needs this and profitable, of course, because it directly relates to sales. So now at this point, we want to kind of outline like what would we do um, in order to accomplish this? So um, the way that we handle this is we then just start to ask questions to the customer themselves. So um, we would say, um, get one of my sales scripts here. We, we ask, um, ask customer, um, actually it's rare during, um, so right there. And the reason for this, we asked them, Hey, what, what kind of protector do you have on your phone? We may know what kind of protector they have. It may not have anything on there. And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's just something my kids put it on or someone put it on. All it is is just to get the conversation going because we don't want to be like, hey, buy this accessory from me. We just want to say, oh, cool. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. And to say, and to say, and to say, oh, okay. Have you had it for a long time? Or, or, you know, how is that working out for you? Or like, you know, whatever, did you like it? And they would be like, well, my, fo my phone obviously broke, so I didn't like it, right? And that gives you the, uh, the thing there. Um, so we let them answer, and this this is like literally what I would put in there. Let them answer, um, put in here like the clarifications. They may say it was one their kids put on, or 
they don't know or they might act oblivious. It doesn't matter. You just want to open the convo. Okay, cool. So as we can see here now at this point, now we're like, okay, cool. So um, um, then you can mention some of your offers at that point or something. So you just go through this process and then you can say, um, respond openly to them. Um, normally I say, oh, okay, makes sense. And, and you know, you can give your tonality. Oh, okay, makes sense. And um, there we go. Um, and then you go through the whole process this way. So that would be like for your upsells and accessories. So generally what I find, and I have a whole training on this, I hired a guy that it was after all my employees walked out, he only worked for me for an hour a day and he was extremely scared to sell anything. He made up all these stories and why he couldn't sell. And I was like, man, I'm at a loss. Like I got like you here and you're not selling. Like this is really bad. Like I need to make money again. And I found out that he wasn't afraid to sell. He was afraid to create the way to sell. He didn't know what to say. So I was like, what if I just tell you what to say, man? Like, can you repeat what I say? And he's like, yeah, I can try it. He became like the best salesperson in my store. He, he sold, we were selling $1,500 worth of accessories per month between like three, four employees. Him by himself sold $4,300 of accessories in a month. Plus myself, I sold like 1,200 that month, fixing all the devices in the back, talking with customers barely. And so huge sales um, and it totally rejuvenated my business cash flow wise. Um, can we have an SOP for watching Zoom calls? Yeah, yeah we'll do that. Um, so, um, Put one in the chat if this makes sense here as far as to answer Ashley's as far as this one here for upsells and bolt-ons. So so of course it'd go longer here, but this is the tonality. You want to say what to say and the reason why you'd say it. Say what to say, why you'd say it, especially whenever it's dealing with a customer. That's, um, that's very important. So, you know, Frank on, um, on that one there, And this one's gonna be for pickups. And Frank, is this talking about like, uh, like customers picking up stuff at the end of the day or like how they talk with them or making sure things are picked up or what is the reason for this one? I'm still, okay, days later. Okay, cool. So um, this process, um, so, so this right here could be like a combo one from what I see, like this could be where, um, <laughs> no, Laura, I feel you. That's why I have to step away and not, and not be involved anymore. Cause I don't follow them. No, <laughs> Um, so with pickups and inventory, so this could be something with the, with, the, um, so this could be something with the preliminary testing part of it, uh, for everyone looking at this one here. So if anything is left behind, it's probably not because of what's happening at that moment. It probably happened during check-in. Maybe the customer had no intention of getting it fixed anyway, or maybe we have fallen behind in our commitment to get it done on time. So the customer is like, I need it back in two days. We take three. And then at that point, they're like, I don't need that thing back. I'm done with it. And they're just like whatever, I'll go pick it up in two weeks. And, um, and that's how that happens. So we have to analyze the whole process, but let's say that's all, that's all honed in, right? We don't have time to, to go over that today, but the pickups, what I would do for that is this seems like a, uh, a process for the sales script. So I would give a particular time in the day that this needs to happen. We don't want to say this needs to happen all day long or whenever you find time, we need to say, um, After lunch, two to two to two to three p.m., we will carry out the callbacks and initiate pickups 
on these, I'm not trying to go faster so we can get this one, on these devices. Um, so at this point, we would just basically make a process there. So we'd say one, um, a set timer for uh, five minutes and gather and um, you could put gather devices or like make sure you know which ones they are, gather devices that are left behind, review notes. So the timer is really to like keep them very precise because this can become a very long done up process where you can take three hours to do it or they can take 15 minutes. So September for five minutes, gather devices that are left behind, review the notes. Um, call customer and if device is within 30 days, say, um, hi, I was calling to Um, you can make a better script for this, like, um, we're gonna make it pretty simple, but make this as elaborate as you need to, but this is the basis of it, um, just for time's sake. Um, hi, I am calling to check on, or to, um, um, calling about your device that is ready for pickup. Um, And, and I want to say you need to make this very clear for them, like what tonality should, like what should they say? How should they phrase it? I'm going to give you the base outline of this and then discuss with them when they plan to pick it up. Um, and then say, okay, great. Have you down for date? Um, we will Okay, perfect. Here we go. Um, and then you have like parameters in here. If And then um, there we go. So that right there, pick up inventory. So we have like that whole process broken down for them where it's like, hey, if the customer does not answer, this is what we do in that particular case. Um, we send them a message. We don't send them an email or a voicemail, whatever it would be, right? We do it that way. Um, and, um, and so that right there is like two examples of, um, of how that works. And so I want to say for... Um, workbench cleanliness, that would be something that would be added into the two tech check as well. So after each one of the devices is checked and tested, you can add in there is the workbench clean and that can be a prerequisite before finalizing the work order and calling the customer. So you add that in there and you have a picture of what the workbench should look like and you match it or you can say, hey, um, you know, make sure you do these types of things and break it down in this way. So for Lena with customers with an in-store, you know, like communication, you'd make it be roughly the same process between these upsells and bolt-ons and the pickup of the inventory. Just state what exactly needs to happen, what particular situations you're gonna find yourself in, kind of the tonality that you want with the phrases that you want, with the clarifications that your employees need to understand while talking with them, and basically outlines it exactly in the same way that you would. And then you train them on that, you role play with them, you talk with them and get all these things done and put in the work ahead of time because then later it'll pay off. Um, and then Laura, so, so for mailing out um, R, uh, RMA and B2B work, um, same thing as these here. I would say pick up some inventory would be pretty close to that there. Set a specific time, date when those should happen, and then um, you know make the outlines for that. Nice. I'll put a one in the chat if this gives you some really good insight as far as how this works. Perfect. I want, to, I want to thank everyone for, for sticking around. So we have literally almost everyone that's been here the whole time. So um, pretty awesome to, uh, to see everyone still here today. Um, put a two in the chat if what you've heard so far on the webinar today 
is useful to you. If you can take some of these things, implement them into your business and get extra clarity with more efficiency and, uh, and all those things. And, um, and I want to, you know, I made a, I made a reel about this the other day. Um, one thing I want to um, encourage everyone to do is as you level up in your business, we want to make sure that we don't get to that first level of saying, Hey, I implemented SOPs and they're working. I have a little bit of time freedom and think that you're done. Like all the aspirations on why you started a business on what you want to become, like where you're like, I want 10 stores. I want, you know, whatever. I want a mansion. I want to begin, whatever it may be. Like, don't stop at that first level because you got complacent because you finally got your head above water and your business finally starts to feel like it's working. Look at that as like the next, the first level, catch your breath and then get ready to ascend to level two, level three, level four, because at each level, there is a new devil that you have to, you know, defeat and continue to ascend um, so that first one, just don't get complacent and keep moving. And that's been my biggest motivator is as I got to that first level, I was like, man, like I'm set. And then I was like, wait, I'm not, I, I can't leave my business as much as I wanted to. Let me get to the second level. And I was like, I'm set. I feel pretty good. I'm like, wait, when it kind of wore off, like the excitement, I was like, I need to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. I kept leveling up. And now at this point, like I have Profixer, I have my repair store. I spent two weeks out of my store. Like I don't wake up early. Like I, I just like chill. It's, it's pretty, it's been pretty awesome. And my business works really, really well. And it's because of the time that I put in to level up to the point that I'm at today. It's not always been that way. And so multiple, multiple level ups. Hey, appreciate you, David, man. Um, yeah, likewise, dude. Thank you. Um, so I want to turn the time back over to, um, Usman to be able to share a little bit about their offer for repair desk. Um, and then once they do that, I want to share just a little bit of our offer with, um, with Profixer, and then we'll just kind of close out the uh, webinar from there. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I really love your energy. Uh, just to, oh, okay. The host says, uh, okay. Um, really love your energy, and um, I, I wish I had the same energy. Probably, you know, I'm, I'm too old for this now. <laughs> But, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to your thought, I, mean, I, I believe uh, one thing I've learned in business is you don't need to be too hard on yourself. I mean, things take time. You don't, you know, you cannot open 10 stores overnight. You have to put one step in front of others. And um, I, I, I believe one thing you need to focus is on is just trying to improve every single day, just not be, be complacent. And, uh, just make sure that uh, you you have a mentor, you read books, and uh, you know you're you you have positive people around you uh, who are you know who who are motivated as you know as you are, uh, and obviously every now and then you will have some uh, some hurdles and and uh, but if 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 you if if, if you're motivated, if you want to find answers, eventually you will find an answer if you're moving in the right direction. So, so yeah, with, with that, uh, don't want to take a lot of our, uh, you know, uh, audience time. Thank you so, so much. It was very helpful. I believe a lot of our customers, uh, I can see a lot of uh, the names, uh, familiar names over here. A lot of them use repairs. Thank you so much. If we haven't lived up to your expectation, like Ben, so I do apologize for that. Um, we are trying everything we can to make sure that uh, Repetus is moving in the right direction. Uh, ben will be helping us on the product as well with, with his feedback so we can improve it. If uh, you are not using Repetus um, uh, and if you want to learn more about it, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we are going to run an amazing offer uh, starting today. Um, so please visit this link to learn more, uh, but uh, we haven't done this offer before. So let's say if you're not using a and uh, you're new to Repairs, you can sign up for Repairs uh, by uh, just paying a one-time fee and you can get the software subscription free for life. So go to the link if you have any questions, uh, you know, fill out the form and uh, reach out to our team. Uh, we also put out a nice video um, if you are someone who, who enjoys videos from Repairs, please watch this video. And if you like it, I'll probably promote this guy. <laughs> but but yeah, over to you, Ben. Perfect. Um, so put a put a one in the chat to thank Usman for uh, putting on the webinar today. I appreciate uh, appreciate you having me here. Um, yes, yeah. So this whole thing has been recorded. So we'll process that and then have that available to rewatch.
So, uh, so yes, Raheem, we'll have that available for you. So one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to invite everyone to um, go to our link as well. And we'll send this out in the, in the chat or in the uh, email that we're going to send out a little bit later. Um, but wanted to, uh, to give everyone the opportunity that if you liked, you know, what you're able to experience here on this call. And I want to say like SOPs, like what Usman was saying, like it, it's, you got to one step after another, you know, as you build with each of those building blocks, like you'll eventually be able to get to the point. It's been years and years since I've been able to get to the point that I am now. And like, it took years to like turn it around. And that was, you know, figuring it out myself, but you know, as you can see people that have shared, you know, things here on uh, this call already, like Travis and Matt, like they came in, had a business that was working, but it wasn't working as well as they wanted it to. And they're able to transform it to now opening up second locations, now working less than ever with increased productivity. And it's all due to, um, you know, the implementation and consistency of doing that. And so I, I want to discuss with anyone that, you know, wants to, uh, um, wants to talk about that. So message us at the, uh, at the link here, and then also we'll send it out through the email too. Um, but if you guys have any uh, questions or anything like that, let us know um, through the channels. You can either message me on Facebook or message Usman, just uh, blow them up inside of Messenger and uh, <laughs> me too. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back to you and, and see how that goes. Um, so Raheem, are you going to make workflow charts quite similar to SOP, but maybe staff can follow them easier? Um, so we, I have not seen as far as our productivity goes, um, that it's necessary to create a workflow chart. We do have workflow charts for some items, but realistically like 99% of them are all the text. Um, you know, it, realistically the SOP is, is not the, um, it, it's used as, an, as, the, uh, as the foundation, but it sits in the background. And so building it out so robust or visually and things like that may help. Uh, maybe if you have some staff that are having problems with it, but most cases I find that text is 100% good. So yeah, in certain situations you may, but what I would do in that particular case, the speed of implementation is best. So create all text SOPs, implement them. The ones that they're having issues on, maybe create visual aids for those and then you know go that route. That way you're able to just hit the top of the top of them. Um, but cool. Um, but that wraps it up for the webinar for today. So I appreciate everyone that's been on. Um, shoot us a message at any of those links and we'll include those as well later on too. Um, but that wraps it up and we'll see y'all later. Thank y'all. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye-bye.